Welcome to Bible 360, 2 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, and probably a lost letter in between, Paul corrected and rebuked the church in Corinth, but Paul begins 2 Corinthians by comforting the church. Uh, Paul had rebuked them out of necessity, but he joyfully shares the same comfort and forgiveness of Christ that he received with them. On account of Paul changing his plans to visit Corinth, some were accusing Paul of being untrustworthy and a liar. In reality, his plans had changed because of his enemies, not because Paul was fickle. Paul had not forgotten them. He would visit them soon. More importantly, what matters is that Christ is reliable. Even if Paul's plans change sometimes, all God's promises are faithfully fulfilled through Jesus. Paul urges the church to forgive and restore those who had repented after being disciplined. We don't follow Christ because we're perfect. We want to restore for sinners, so we forgive them. Paul's rivals in Corinth are cultured and rich naysayers who claim Paul's not impressive. They try to undermine Paul. In response to the demand for letters of recommendation like they have, Paul says, you wouldn't even be a church without me. You're my letter. Of course, I have haters because the gospel can't be ignored. To those who are dying, it smells like death and they hate it. But to those who have been saved, it is the fragrance of life itself. What matters is the Holy Spirit, not letters. Indeed, the letters of the Torah kill, but the Spirit of God gives life through Jesus. That's why Moses had to put on a veil. The Israelites could not look at his face that shone with glory after receiving the Old Covenant. The Covenant was glorious since it came from God and was revealed His will, but it also condemned and brought death. So you can see how much more glorious the New Covenant is through Jesus. This New Covenant is not only good and holy, it rescues us. However, those who only focus on the law will never be able to see God or receive all that God wants to share. Then Paul addresses the charge that he's not impressive and talks about Christian leaders and status. The apostles, they're just ordinary and unimpressive jars of clay. However, what they carry is the precious got treasure of the gospel. Paul is not impressive because Paul's not the point. Jesus is. The apostles, they're beat up, persecuted, but they carry on. Christian leaders might suffer too sometimes, but they're delivering the good news and life, and that's all that matters. So despite his troubles, Paul doesn't lose heart, and neither should his listeners. We suffer and groan sometimes in this life, but God will deliver us and give us new bodies when his plan is fulfilled. We are a new creation in Christ, and we see the world, our bodies, and life from a new perspective. And that's why the apostles were focusing on God's will and plan and refusing to be distracted or slowed down by physical pain, hardship, or opposition. Instead, they push ahead with the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling sinners to God and Christians to one another. So, be reconciled to God, Paul tells the Corinthians, but this won't happen through some cheap imitation that tries to tame the gospel or make it less offensive. Actually, Paul's suffering proves his sincerity and it's consistent with Jesus' own example. If the Corinthians despise suffering, then what will they think of Jesus? So, don't get stuck on a sinking ship of those who despise suffering on the account of Christ. God's people have always been called to be distinct from the world. You can't separate Jesus from sal and salvation from suffering. So don't follow swindlers who talk about Christ, but are really all about money, power, and their egos. Paul hopes the Corinthians will welcome him because rejecting Paul's message is rejecting Jesus. Paul tells them he will ask for an offering for the distressed and persecuted church in Jerusalem. Paul's selling point is that this is a way to express their love. Fellow Christians are in trouble. The Corinthians can help them and simultaneously spread the gospel. He doesn't command them or demand a tithe. Rather, he says, what a great opportunity to thank Christ, who, though he was rich, for your sake became poor. Paul warns them that he's told others of their generosity, so they're not going to be taken by surprise, but will be ready to set aside money when he comes. Paul says those who sow generously will also reap generously, and helpfully clarifies a few verses later that he's referring to righteousness. This is not a promise to bless your bank account if you give. It's a promise that the more generous you are, the more opportunities you will have to be generous. If you do get more, the reason is so that you can continue to share it and give it away. Corinth was affluent enough that they had paid speakers, sort of like talk show hosts or YouTubers. Those folks saw churches as a prime opportunity. They spoke the lingo, but their goal was not really to spread the gospel, but to make money and gain more followers. Competing for church's attention, they say, Paul doesn't even get paid, he's an amateur. How popular, successful can he be? He doesn't, he gets chased out of town. You wanna be like him? He gets beat up and attacked. No, follow me. Paul compares the church in Corinth to his daughter who is betrothed to Christ. He wants them to stay faithful to Jesus, not fall for these scoundrels. Paul says, I'm no amateur. I was officially sent by the church in Jerusalem to share the gospel. I'm sorry that I was not charging you and that offends your sensibilities. And I'm not only Jewish, I'm way more zealous for the old covenant than any of those fools were but I've learned that the gospel is far better. I'll engage in some of the same foolish boast, boasting of my opponents, although what I'll boast about is my suffering. 
I've been beaten, whipped, shipwrecked, naked and cold. I've been in danger from the Romans and in danger from the Jews. I could talk about impressive visions, but instead, let's talk about this thorn in my flesh that has hindered me. I begged God three times to take it away from me, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. I'm not bringing up all the good things I could as proof because I don't want acknowledgement. What I want is for you to come to your senses. The gospel is not about pride, status, or wealth. That's the way of this world. But you now belong to the way of Jesus. Don't follow those who promote slander, gossip, and arrogance on top of sexual morality and debauchery. Rather, entrust yourselves in the direction of your lives to Christ. Rather than follow the things the world chases after, seek peace, love, and be of one mind as you follow Christ together.